Good day and welcome to our viewers wherever you are. I hope you had a great weekend. It is October 16th, 2022. I am your host and presenter Jean-Paul Turaishimier. Last time I talked about East African integration in general and how Kagame is a problem for the integration. Today, as I promised last time, I am going to talk about Uganda. I'm going to focus on Uganda versus Rwanda relationship, a, pecu a peculiar relationship, how President Kagame is a dent to East African integration. First thing first, I shouldn't call someone a dent, but that is the only way I can explain PK's, uh, Paul Kagame's role in East African integration. I decided to speak about Uganda versus Rwanda after Paul Kagame skipped Uganda's invitation to attend the 60th birthday of Uganda's independence. Keep in mind that Paul Kagame, or President Kagame, had just returned from Singapore to watch cars race. He was watching Formula One. He doesn't need to take a vacation to go to such events. It's not the first time you've heard Kagame going to Europe to watch Champions League game, the finals, Premier League games, and other nonsense trips or visits. He had recently attended Moho Zikaine Rugawa's birthday. But he didn't think that Uganda's birthday was as important, which raises the questions about Muhozi and Kagame's relationship. Today, as we speak, Muhozi is in Kigali to visit his uncle, as he always says on Twitter. And this is actually a third visit to, Kag to Kigali to visit Kagame or his uncle Kagame. Third visit in one year. I know some people believe that the relationship between Kigali and Kampala has gotten better because of Muhozi and his visit. But I, I can tell you that this is still a myth to a lot of people, including myself. As far as I know, Rwanda's propaganda or Rwanda propaganda newspapers or media are still publishing trash about Uganda, in particular President Museveni. And this explains why those newspapers cannot be accessed in Uganda. And today, Rwandan citizens are not allowed to trade freely with Uganda. Those who dare are killed. At some point between 2019 and 2022, Rwandan police search every businesses and stores in Rwanda, especially in Kigali, to make sure no Uganda product is displayed on their shelves. The government of Rwanda warned owners that they will that they should voluntarily remove any items with Ugandan label on it before the government can search or will search their stores. And if the government searched their stores and found something, if the business owner, the store owner did not remove the item with, with Ugandan labor on it, including Uganda water gear, they were prosecuted. So, Muhozi visits to Kagame, for the large part, are personal and beneficial between the nephew and uncle. For instance, in the video that I'm about to play for you, you are going to hear Rwandan citizens asking questions. Why 
one of their own was shot dead by the police. The journalist, you hear the journalist asking the people or these citizens whether this guy wasn't a suspect or wasn't suspected of doing business with Ugandans. Meaning, if that was the case, then his death and police excessive force will be justified. Before I continue, let me play this video for you. I'll, I'll be back after this video. The video, unfortunately, is in Kenya, Rwanda, but pretty much multiple citizens are repeating the same story, saying that the guy was innocent, he was not guilty of crossing to Uganda. Anyway, here is the clip. kwa yamenye kwa yamenye ko nyine umuntu yarashwe ubwo abapolisi bari mu kazi ah polisi giye gukurikirana ese byari ngombwa ko abapolisi barasa byari ngombwa ko bakoresha amasasu cyangwa bakamurasa wenda bakaba murashe mu kicwa mwase uko mu byabintu twabaho ubwo twese turi mu gatujye mu bugande na bazatwikire oya regurebye nawe nk'umuntu wende umuntu arakubwira ati ngwino ngubwire urabyutse ntabuze icyo icarenda kukubwira hanyuma rero nyine bahita bahita bakura sana ni kintu bakuvugishije ubwo si kibaza yacyaye kwa gwa hiki ko ntacyo kwa yari mu motari nicyo ngicyo rero kada nkubu ndu mushonji ibirayi batabye hano hirya nari kubirya bikagira abana kamaro ariko ntago wataba ibirayi usi ngusiga umuntu numuntu ugomba kumwica kubera yuko uba wicishije abantu ibirayi kubera iki babitabye ibyo birayi bari bari kuvuga ngo biturutse muri Uganda mu byukuri mushunga afatanye no mu Buganda ariko nako byari bivuye mu Buganda byari bivuye mushunga none he birayi barabifata baza bahita bazana ibikori barabitwika ayi bakabifata bakabitwika ngo ibifurayi bivuye Uganda kandi tubihashe kandi twabihinze ibuganda rero ntabwo dukunze kwa gihe ubuno twari tugiye kugirana imishikirano ngo tujye ibuganda baravuga ngo covid yaje naho tujye ibuganda abo basirikare bari kuzaho abapolisi bakirwa ku mupaka bakatubuza amahwemo ni wava kugura ikintu kwiso ko hariya ngo kibanyuzeho niba hani nyuma dutuyeyo hari amushunga dutuyeyo kuvana ikintu umushunga ugitwaye kwisoko aba kugikuye mu Uganda kuvana hani nyuma hano ngano ngo gikuye hano ngaha inzira ya kwisoko ni ingiye guhura hano hepfa vuga tuvuye mu Uganda baratubanga mu kujyo bwose bishoboka none se urugero umuntu atuye ku mupaka sibyo ni umunyarwanda araje aje guhaha ibishimo arataje bagahita bamufata ngubwo ibishimo ngabijyanye mu bugande kana bijyanye he mu rugo none waka tuzanira ibishimo tukarya tukajya guhaha ya bikuraga ya bikuraga mu isoko none ho rero we abizana ibishimo tugahaha yo tukarya oya ibishimo bituka mu Rwanda ntago biva mu bugande none ho barangije baravanga ari kubijyana ibugande nicyo bamuhoye twayamenye twayamenye ko nyine umuntu yarashwe ubwo abapolisi bari mu kazi uh, akagerageza kugira ngo ya yabarwanya uh, yure byo mvuga ko niko byagenze akaba yitabye imana ubu uh, igikurikiraho nuko uh, polisi giye gukurikirana ese byari ngombwa ko abapolisi ba, barasa uh, byari ngombwa ko bakoresha amasasu cyangwa bakamurasa wenda bakaba murashe mu kicwa kandi kimwe icyakabiri ngira ngo niba mwana hageze mwari byo ko nyine nzego zifatanye nje zajarije kugira ngo zihumuriza abaturage zibakarume icyo ni kintu nacyo cyagaragaye ariko ikindi kigira ngo tuvuge nuko ikintu cyari cyo cyose cyaba cyaba kuba kibaye amateko yakurikizwa yabararebwa ba police yabararebwa ba ibyo bikorwa byo gucuruza ibyo bya bwenge byo gukora magendu byiki yamuteko yakurikizwa akaba ari pereza rigiye kuba ariko tubwira n'abaturage yuko uh, ibintu byo gushaka gutera abapolisi amabuye uh, nk'ibintu byagaragaye yuko bitemewe eh, kirazira uh, ntibakwiye no kubikora kubera yuko amateka arahari ugize amakosa urengera amategeko wese arakurikirana kabone niyo yabara mu polisi cyangwa se no muturage yego uh, amakuru ahari niko imeze arabicuruza arabyambutsa 
icyo ni kimwe ariko ubwo reka ipereza ariko rwe hanyuma ubwo ibizavamo biza nabyo mwaza twaza twayamenyesha As I said before I play this video to you This is the video it is only two weeks old Citizens are demanding answers regarding their own who was shot dead and they were saying that uh, this guy was innocent he didn't do anything he did not commit any crime he did not cross into uganda which means going to uganda it is a crime and that is supposed to be an east african community member state let me remind you about some important events regarding regarding Uganda and Rwanda relationship or relations it was it was february 2019 when rwanda shut down the border with uganda a lot of excuses were given including border posts reconstruction or construction or rwanda being unsafe in uganda even when rwandans themselves said that uh, they were wi- they are willing to take risks as for most of them ugandan or uganda trade was the only way of the uh, was the uh, the only way of survival that's how they survived that's the only business they are, they, they live at the border with uganda they trade with ugandan with their ugandan counterparts that's how they they survive that that's how they make ends meet citizens who crossed into uganda or those who defy the order were killed on the spot as i mentioned earlier products made in uganda were treated as fraudulent fraudulent like they were like fraud even though they were coming from a member a, an east african member state store owners were punished or prosecuted or forced to shut down their businesses because they, they sold ugandan products any product that said made in uganda president museveni personally was on the receiving end of those targets of the relentless insults in the Rwandan media a Rwandan owned newspaper new times to be specific printed a story or a series of stories about president museveni suggesting that museveni is an, illeg- an illegitimate child born from an indigenous umutwa mother the insults were printed like a week after week the following the following are series of articles printed in new times authored by the so-called professor chuti manase manase is the current deputy foreign affairs minister in charge of east african community he held ma- many government high level positions so his his writing i don't believe that his writing uh his own alone they were not his his own my analysis or my conclusions are that his writings were pokagam is approved and whether it was a coincidence or a test to president museveni pokagam himself no know, uh, knows why he was uh, manasse was his choice to represent him to uganda's 60th birthday or independence just a few days ago anyways let, take a listen these articles read to us by ange dan shuti manasse proudly put his name and signature on it and they were printed as i said they were printed in a government owned newspaper new times take a listen rwanda 
Rwanda-Uganda Relations, an Informed Analysis by Professor Manasseh Nshuti. I have read extensively lots of views by various commentators on the above rather important and serious issue with interest and discernment as a party that claim informed understanding of issues that have characterized Rwanda-Uganda relations since 1997. Issues, as will be argued later, that will need to be addressed by Ugandan political elite instead of window dressing, which only serves to postpone the solutions at the expense socio-economic welfare of two sister countries and a people that are bound by history, blood relations, and location that defines their fate and thus destiny for generations to come. This bond cannot be discounted, underwritten, nor demeaned by political machinations, for this is very expensive to both countries and should thus be avoided and ironed out as and when these arise. Trended. Destabilization of Rwanda by Uganda top political elite is as trended as it is an ill-intended strategy that in my opinion has only served to destroy, beyond repair, the best ever strategic alliance that had immense economic as well socio-political benefits to both countries, at least during the current political leadership. For instance, Ugandan leadership has extended to Rwanda National Congress, RNC, a terrorist group that has killed dozens and maimed hundreds of Rwandans, has publicly agitated its intentions to remove a democratically elected government in Rwanda, which in itself is a myopic illusion at its extreme and worst. President Museveni's meetings with RNC top diplomats, Charlotte, Charlotte Mukanghosi and Eugene Gasana in the first week of March 2019, and meetings Museveni later said was accidental. No accidental meetings with presidents happen anywhere in the world, speaks volumes of Uganda's intention to destabilize Rwanda. It's an intention that is not a political daydream, but one that has served to corroborate other past ill motives against the Rwandan government and Rwandans in general. As will be argued later, support to force Democratique de Liberation du Rwanda, FDLR, a genocidal outfit in East Democratic Republic of Congo against Rwanda, has left many Rwandans dumbfounded with regard to intentions of the Ugandan ruling elite. Given that this terrorist outfit claimed the lives of over one million of her compatriots in 1994 has left an in indelible scar on her conscience as a country and a people that anyone, party or country that supports or is even sympathetic with it, earns eternal wrath of Rwandans. However, support of destabilizing forces by Uganda's ruling elite is not a new phenomenon. What is new, though, is the form as well as substance the support has taken of late. As way back as 1997 and 1998, support for such negative elements by Uganda to Major Furuma, Sebarenzi, Sindashonga, Bridge General, BEM, Habyarimana, etc. is irrefutable. Issuing of Ugandan passports to FDLR leaders like Ignace Murguana Shaka, Nsengiyumva Hyacinth Rafiki, Wallace Nsengiyumva, and Major Protes Miranya, an international wanted genocide criminal, in 2006 to travel to Europe and in the region to conduct their subversive activities against Rwanda shocked many in Rwanda then but no more. Facilitation by Uganda given to Colonel Patrick Karegea in 2007 and then to Kayumba Nyamgasa in 2010 when they were going into self-exile is in the know of Rwandans and is trended to earlier subversive activities by Ugandan political elites. As will be pointed out later, some of these so-called dissidents had the blessings of and are in fact a machination of Ugandan ruling elite in their ill-conceived strategic project of destabilizing Rwanda that has fortunately not succeeded nor ever will for any such move is known before it is implemented. The headache with the Ugandan ruling elite is why Rwandans get to know of such destabilization in real time. 
instead of the same being bothered as to why this should be done to a potential ally in a sister country. Reasons behind this unfortunate trend will be highlighted in subsequent articles. Unprecedented Nonetheless, this trend has reached unprecedented scale of late with dire consequences to the relationship between Rwanda and Uganda. Ugandan political elite have arranged and or organized destabilizing forces, RNC, FDLR, etc. into the so-called P5 location in DRC so as to destabilize Rwanda. It is a project that is dead in the water, for Rwanda has more than the capacity to deal with these elements, despite what the Ugandan political elite would have been told to the contrary by their RNC allies. As pointed out earlier, that Uganda can mobilize FDLR with their genocide ideology of extermination of Tutsis in Rwanda, an ideology akin to that of ISIS, is beyond comprehension, whatever differences there may be between Rwanda and Uganda. That any country, least Uganda, which should understand this better, can support this, groups, this group has baffled many Rwandans. Rwanda has in custody La Forge Fils Baze, who was a spokesperson of FDLR, and Lieutenant Colonel Teofil Abega, who was FDLR's head of intelligence, who were arrested by the FARDC, Army of the Democratic Republic of Congo, on the 17th of December 2018. They were arrested at DRC Uganda Bunag Bunagana border on their way from Kampala where on December 15, 2018, they had held talks with RNC aimed at destabilizing Rwanda's security. The FDLR leaders were facilitated by Dr. Philemon Mateke, Uganda's Minister for Regional Cooperation, that also chaired the FDLR RNC meeting in Kampala. These genocidal elements carried with them lots of information on mobilization of these and others against the government of Rwanda. Rwanda has more detailed information from these FDLR leaders regarding Uganda's roles and plans in support to these armed groups operating in the Kivus to destabilize the region. This is also true as regards the wealth of information that Rwanda has multiple sources on activities of RNC leaders and operatives who have accepted to join hands with FDLR at the leadership of Uganda. These developments come at a time when available information is collaborated by the UN Group of Experts report published on December 31st, 2018. This is the latest factual indictment of the Museveni regime of its anti-Rwanda activities. The report details Uganda as a recruitment hub for groups that have declared war on Rwanda's legitimate government. Denying this by the Ugandan ruling elite or even by President Museveni himself, Quote, there is no question of Uganda supporting anti-Rwanda elements, end quote. Does not and cannot negate the enormity of this unprecedented situation and on the contrary, reinforces its magnitude and consequences. Obote II Antics For the last two years, the Museveni regime has conducted brutal abductions, arrests, detention, and torture of over a thousand innocent Rwandan civilians. Uganda's chief Tensi of military intelligence, CMI, and other Ugandan intelligence services continue to conduct these barbaric crimes against innocent Rwandans akin to what happened to Rwandans in Uganda, some of whom were Ugandans, during the Obote II regime, accused of supporting Museveni. They paid a high price, included, including undocumented murders. Some of us who lived in Uganda at that time have indelible memories of the same. And also, although this mobilized young Rwandan fighters to join the NRA, also known as the National Resistance Army, now UPDF, in large numbers, and as will be argued later, contributed fundamentally to President Museveni's eventual rise to power in 1985. No Rwandese would have least imagined or expected that this would happen under President Museveni's regime, 
a regime that was supposed to stop Obote II torture and murder of real and imaginary enemies of his regime. That this can now happen under the same president to whom these Rwandans were accused of supporting have left many Rwandans perplexed. Worse still, it is done with and in cohort with RNC renegades who pick out innocent Rwandans for abduction by Ugandan intelligence tells it all. An, an alliance with a dissident force for intelligence gathering on a neighborhood country is a situation so bizarre and with far-reaching consequences. Testimonies and evidence of these heinous crimes against Rwandans in Uganda abound despite that Ugandans living in Rwanda live in peace and harmony alongside their Rwandan brothers and sisters, which is expected for we are bound by fate and destiny that no political system can undo by any means or deed whatsoever. To be continued. Rwanda-Uganda Relations, an Informed Analysis, Part 2 by Professor Manasseh Nchuti. In the previous article, I did highlight some destabilizing activities by Ugandan ruling elite for over 20 years as someone with informed understanding of issues that have characterized Rwanda-Uganda relations since 1997. And despite constant denials against hard evidence, such as bound to be expensive politically, economically, as well as their social implications on the relationship between the two countries. Issues highlighted earlier, harboring and organizing destabilizing agents against Rwanda, as well as torture and imprisonment of over a thousand Rwandans by Uganda. Serious crimes which were brought to the attention of more than 350 top officials, both in government and private sector, during the recent government retreat in Gabiro, on March 9th to 12th, 2019, by President Kagame, who gave details of these issues. As pointed out earlier, the acts of destabilization of Rwanda by Uganda's ruling elite, where elite means inner circle of President Museveni, the Hema ruling class to be precise, is trended due to a combination of reasons that defy logic and portends to demean a sovereign state despite the trended failure of this strategy for the last 20 years without lessons learned thereof by such political elite. Reasons behind this bizarre situation we find ourselves in include Control of Rwanda The liberation of Rwanda by RPA, now RDF, was a long process that was very expensive in all aspects possible, financial and human. This process began, began way back in late 1970s before the current Uganda ruling elite was anywhere in the picture. Nevertheless, Museveni's Bush War of 1980s presented an opportunity for the actu actualization of our liberation struggle, a struggle that was to return home millions of Rwandans who were scattered the whole world and who were told by the late Habyarimana's regime that they could not be allowed to return home for Rwanda was full. And so thousands of young Rwandans in Uganda were to fight the so-called Bush War alongside others from 1980s to 1985 when they dislodged Obote II as well as Rutkwa regimes and brought Museveni to power. As pointed out in part one of these series, former Ugandan President Obote's persecution of Rwandans in Uganda energized many young and determined Rwandans to join the war to oust Obote, who was a determined enemy of Rwandans in Uganda. The fact is, there is no way Museveni would have prevailed against Obote without the support of such a determined force of young Rwandans pushed against the wall by Obote. As Professor Mahmoud Mandani in his paper, African States, Citizens in War, a case study put it, quote, Baganda peasants hated Obote, but they were not ready to die fighting him, end quote. Despite Obote's negation of a people, that a good Maganda is a dead one. And so Rwandan refugees became natural allies in the struggle to, of survival of last resort. Many young Rwandan fighters died in this struggle, although this is not mentioned anywhere in Uganda for political expedi expedience that cannot mask facts. 
And although in his book, The Mustard Seed, Museveni purports to imply that this, is what, this was a war fought by himself and his brother Selim Saleh, rever, reversal facts hold true. However, a number of these Rwandan fighters were to be elevated to senior positions, including late Fred Rijema and now President Paul Kagame, among others. Not because this was a favor, but rather it was on merit. When these young Rwandans decided to fight back home in 1990, there is no single Ugandan who joined them to liberate Rwanda. These young fighters from Uganda were to be joined by their brothers and sisters from Burundi, Republic of Congo, then Zaire, from within Rwanda and from the rest of the world who understood the cause. By 1993, RPA, now RDF, could no longer be defined as an army made up of fighters from Uganda, but rather a mixture for, from the aforementioned who knew little of the claims of the contribution by Uganda to our struggle for liberation. Ugandan political elite did not realize this development, regardless of the fact that even if RPA remained a predominantly Ugandan-born slash bred army, control by the Ugandan ruling elite would not have been possible as this was to be a national army that served national interest, period. Nevertheless, Museveni did provide logistics and weapons, not necessarily for payback as there was no contract to this effect, but out of his own vi volition. Given the foregoing and current trends, however, his contribution was eternal debt, never mind one owned, one owed by Uganda to Rwanda's contribution to its liberation. And so the narrative that, quote, Museveni helped Banyarwanda, end quote, to return home is negated by his minimal contribution to the same. But the later, but the latter narrative has defined the relationship between Rwanda and Uganda were such terms as, quote, Uganda groomed the entire leadership of Rwanda. Rwandan leadership is ungrateful, rebellious, and disrespect to elders, end quote. Red Ugandan political elite is a common currency among a section of this elite and seems to have been sold to the populace. And so this elite has held view that Rwanda and her leadership owe a debt of allegiance that should be paid in form of subordination and subjection. When Kigali said no to the insolence of Ugandan political elite who held the view that Rwanda should be run from Kampala and those who did not oblige should be removed slash changed and or make their governance difficult explains the trend of destabilization of Rwanda since 1997. Thus, memories of senior RPF cadres are fresh with regard to imposition of Silas Majambere, late Seth Sendashonga, even diversionary attitudes of Pasteur Bizumungu to this effect. Recruitment of late Karejea and Kayumba is an open secret among these senior cadres as well, all aimed at creating stooges in Kigali whom the Sili could then direct from Kampala. Resistance to these machinations by Rwandan leadership has thus been a boon in the fresh of this elite for far too long. Ugandan political elite, especially President Museveni, has not come to terms with the, fact, with the effect that Rwanda is a sovereign state with structures that are not run on personal sentiments, but rather based on the base interests of our country and our people, majority of whom have no idea of nor are interested in their purported debt. In fact, if this was to be the case, this strategy would have been a disaster that Rwanda nor Uganda could not afford to underwrite. For Rwandans that return from Uganda constitute a modest percentage of our entire population, population and as such could not have imposed such Ugandan demands on others. Moreover, such a strategy for the sake of argument is a serious contradiction to Rwandan values. Agachiro, dignity, self-respect, independence, held so dear in our culture at a Rwandan, that a Rwandan would die fighting to retain the same. And so when President Kagame told leaders at the national retreat that he would rather be killed than kneel before anybody, he spoke for all Rwandans and this is his statement. This, his statement, is loaded. 
However, the trended destabilization machination of Uganda's ruling elite since 1997 was aimed at not only creating power structures in Kigali managed by stooges of Kampala, but also make Rwanda a region of Uganda under the control of the said political elite and not necessarily to develop Rwanda, but rather to serve their political egos and through these, their economic interests, which underpin their power framework. And so the current trend that has been, that has seen Uganda grouping destabilizing rebels from RNC to FDLR into the so-called P5, which is a project in futility, is part of the trend to create an alternative government that is a stooge to Ugandan political elite. That the said political elite are working with renegade Kayumba and his associates, who are also working with Uganda's security agents to mobilize rebels for an evil cause, is on the radar of every Rwandan, especially now that these acts have taken on other forms and shape leaving their objective constant, destabilization of Rwanda. When Tanzania dislodged Ugandan dictator Ida Amin from power in 1978, they did not harbor this cheap mindset of influencing events in Uganda. They left Uganda and Ugandans to organize themselves the way they deemed fit. There was no such childish sentiments as Tanzania groomed the entire leadership of Uganda. Ugandan leadership is ungrateful, rebellious, and disrespect of elders. Although there are other reasons behind the behavior of Uganda's political elite, as will be outlined later. I am not sure that Tanzania even imagined that Museveni would ever be Uganda's president, for Obote was your man given his socialist tendencies and his close relationship with the late Walimu Julius Nyerere. Assuming that Tanzania did the same to Uganda, for in 1978, liberation of Uganda against dictator Idi Amin Dada, one wonders where Uganda would be today. In that particular case, the contribution of Ugandan rebels, of which Museveni was one, to that war was minimal as Tanzania did most of the job. Given the foregoing, therefore, the best strategy for Ugandan political elite should have been, quote, live and let live to be continued. Let me ask you, do you think Kagame would have allowed anyone who has said similar things, even actually less, do you think he would have allow allowed him to Kigali? I doubt it. Kagame has made a few people or declared a few people persona non grata who did less offensive remarks on him or on Rwanda, despite that, those actually remarks were truthful. So Muho's attempt to mend fences with Kagame on behalf of Uganda, I, I do not believe that it is going to bear fruits. Maybe temporarily, but Kagame will remain a dent in East African community. The integration is going to be a problem with Kagame still in charge in Rwanda unless members of East African community concede to his dominance in the region, which will cause chaos in their respective countries as a result. So the choice of Nshuti Manasseh to represent Kagame, that to me, and I believe to everybody, including President Museveni, that was truly an insult to President Museveni. I don't think that was the, the only choice or the, the, the best choice that Kagame saw fit to represent him in Uganda. It is, as, it is the same thing. Like, for instance, if, if he had chosen James Kabarewe, who had said publicly that Rwandans going to Uganda, Rwandans going to Uganda are scavengers, or scavenging. Keep in mind that these guys, Chuti Manasseh, James Kabarewe, they, 
there were scavengers in Uganda for years. This is the country that they sought ref refuge in or asylum. Yes, I understand they were, they were not safe 100%. Under uh, Obote's regime, Idi Amin, but that's how they survived. They didn't think going back to Habyari Mana's uh, country was a better alternative. So they still owe a lot to Ugandans. But calling, saying that the, the Rwandans who are going to Uganda are scavengers, and the insults by <laughs> Shruti Manasseh, shameless or shamelessly going to represent Kagame? That tells me everything that I need to know about the relationship, relationship between Uganda and Kagame. I mean, Uganda and Rwanda and Kagame and M7 in particular. I don't think Kagame forgot what was printed in news uh, in New Times articles. You all just heard. I did not make this up. This is a printed and is still available on Google. Just search those words as read by Ange. So thank you for listening. Till next time. Again, my name is Jean-Paul Touré Chimier. I'll see you next time.